Okay, folks, can we uh, get together here? Uh, I guess uh, our committee meeting, uh, our, our utilities committee meeting, and we have a land acknowledgement. Uh, TNRD acknowledges we connect with many First Nations uh, across our vast uh, regional district. And today we're located on the Tecumseh-Sequatmec territory situated within the unceded ancestral lands of the Sequatmec Nation. Uh, and the TNRD appreciates the partnership that we have with Tecumseh-Sequatmec and the Sequatmec people and uh, respect the territory and land on which we gather today. Uh, I guess, uh, do we have any additions or deletions uh, from the agenda? Uh, I'm going to, uh, if we have time, bring up some stuff under new business, uh, uh, but uh, we'll move on to the minutes. Uh, we have the uh, the May 4th, 2023 20, Utility System Committee minutes. Uh, um, is there any, uh, I guess, uh, so moved? Second. <laughs> Second, thank you. Uh, uh, any... Uh, Additions, deletions, changes? Uh, all right, all in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, reports, we have terms of reference review. And um, uh, Jamie, do you wanna speak to this or somebody speaking to this? Thank you, Chair. So uh, since uh, many people in this room, room won't know me, my name is Greg Lois. I'm the new General Manager of Corporate and Legislative Services here at the TNID, so it's very nice to meet you all. Um, this is my first committee meeting at the, uh, at the TNID, and I know there was a uh, desire from at least some people to initially just go over the terms of reference and um, just make sure that everyone's familiar with the scope of the committee and the, uh, the intention of the work to be done here. There is a specific change which uh, Mr. Verrera will be proposing later, which uh, talks about increasing the number of meetings from two to three per year in order to make sure the work is um, uh, accomplished more effectively. Um, I think the uh, big uh, meat, essentially, of the work in the terms of reference is in the mandate section, which uh, notes that the, uh, the purpose or the mandate of the committee is providing assistance and advice to the board and senior staff in strategic operation and development of utility services owned or operated by the TNID, make, considering and making recommendations to the board on policy issues relating to utility service programs and initiatives, and considering and making recommendations on other policy issues or other matters referred to the committee by the board. And a little bit of typo cleanup that we, uh, we can do in there, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so essentially, as much as anything, um, I think the question is, is there anything in, uh, in there that members of the committee either uh, would like further discussion or explanation on? Is there anything that you feel that um, this committee can look at that isn't uh, in there? Or is there any other opportunity is there any time when, say, this committee has felt that it's been asked to do things beyond that, and essentially wanting to make sure that it is focused tightly on those policy issues and um, utility services? And then we've got, obviously, the membership, terms of appointment, and st uh, staff support, which essentially goes to how you accomplish all of those goals. Uh, any comments? Uh, any thoughts on the? No? Uh, well, all right. Uh, uh, thank you, Greg, and um, uh, welcome to the TNRD and, uh, and our committee, of course. Um, uh, I, I guess uh, uh, under the mandate, if we take on any other mandates under any other utilities, would the existing language be able to accommodate that? So the um, language as it currently uh, stands incorporates uh, the operation and development of utility services owned or operated by the TNID. So if there's any service which the TNID properly owns and operates, then that is a utility service that would be within the remit of this committee as it currently stands and providing the overview and strategic guidance uh, according to that. Oh, thank you for that. Uh, uh, Director uh, Asaf. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair Mike. <laughs> um, actually, I sorry, just popped in my mind um, in relation to area some stuff uh, with the uh, solid waste management um, services and how um, there was a plot of land owned 
by solid waste management. And I wonder, because it states the mandate to provide assistance, et cetera, et cetera, and development of utility services owned or operated. So it doesn't specify land that is owned by the uh, uh, solid waste management. Could this committee also provide uh, input on um, assets owned by um, solid waste management? Uh, I'm going to say no, this committee wouldn't be the best place to decide that. Typically, the board would make any decisions around land owned or operated if it's specific to a service like solid waste, for example. Um, and that, like, let's use that example, we were developing a new uh, aspect of the solid waste service that would be discussed at the solid waste committee and the policy and direction would come out of that committee. Uh, well, I think that we'll move on then to additional utility system committee meeting. Uh, uh, we have one proposed for December 13th. Uh, do you want to speak to that, Jamie? Sure. Thanks, Chair. I'll, I'll just speak to it briefly. I, I mentioned in the report, um, just the, the two recommendations are around uh, the additional meeting, specifically this year to look at our bylaw and update our rates bylaw. So the rates bylaw does expire this year. We, when we brought in the water metering program, we intentionally had a sunset of just a two-year term. So we had forced ourselves to reassess um, the actual usage data and make sure our rates were within what we were planning on doing around, you know, getting enough revenue um, without getting too much revenue. A lot of the concerns we heard from the public when we were first coming, bringing in water meters that it was a cash grab that we were going to be getting um, more money and the intention was although we could use more money and the intention wasn't to, um, you know, increase uh, the impact to individual users. The idea was to get a user pay system where the more you use, the more you pay. Long story short, um, we have had uh, um, some hurdles that we're working through around our billing process and getting updated data. But once we have that data numbers crunched, we want to come back to this committee and discuss those rates and have a proposed rates bylaw that would be discussed and debated at this committee. And then the recommendation would go forward to the board to actually enact it in bylaw so we can charge those rates in 2024. And just so uh, in timing, we have the December 13th meeting, we make the recommendation to the board and then that board, when would it hit that board in order to make that uh, approval or otherwise um well as long as you don't send us back to totally rewrite the bylaw it would likely go back to the board in the january meeting yeah which is enough time for our first quarter building that's not a problem Thank and you. then the subsequent recommendation or, or, or uh, part of the recommendation is also to just increase the meeting frequency of this committee to three times a year as you know if you guys have been on this committee now we keep calling extra meetings because there's more business and there's also a lot of discussion on each meeting just because of the technical nature of the discussions here so um, we're just recommending to go ahead and we start scheduling three a year uh, so we're not having to try piece it in uh, as we have been doing director morris Wow, a double ding. Oh my goodness. Um, thank you. I just um, maybe a looking forward question. Um, given that there may be some changes, third meeting and decisions that we would then bring forward, are there any substantive changes on user pay rate structures that we're generally considering to implement in 2024? Are there any surprises that that we need to have a little bit of a heads up to think about? That's a loaded question. I, I guess I would say, yes, we are considering a few different options and significant changes. And that's why we want to have a whole meeting <laughs> to discuss it. <laughs> yeah, and I, I would, I, I can't speak more about it until we actually have a recommendation as because um, we, we know it needs to be updated and um, as as everyone around this table knows that we have you know funding gaps so we need to make some decisions about how we want to um, you know start addressing those and where we can go with the rates any other discussion okay I think we'll move on to um, operations update then please oh sorry Jane. Yeah, 
Oh, and uh, so there's there's the motion there before we move to the next agenda item, but I just wanted to mention then, sorry, I should have done this at the beginning of the meeting, if it's okay with the chair, if we can change the order of agenda item number uh, 5.3 with 5.4, typically we would prefer to do the capital update before the operations update. Sure, so do we want to deal with this motion after those or now? You should deal with the motion now, yeah. Uh, Director Houghton and uh, Director Sao. <laughs> All those, uh, uh, oh, any discussion on the recommendation? Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, all right, so we move to uh, capital update and then operations update. I'll turn it over to Tyrone. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, so we've got a capital update would be the other one. Can <laughs> we get the capital update, please? Yeah, so just a little bit of history um, for the committee here. We've typically done the capital update followed by the operations update twice a year. Um, and clearly we've had a lot more business to discuss. So hence the uh, request for additional meetings, but I'll get right into the capital update. And this is the agenda for this presentation, basically a summary of our current projects and then updates on the individual projects and then what's um, coming down for future projects there. So we have six capital projects ongoing. Um, our first one is our new Build Canada Fund, Small Communities Fund, and the acronyms are fantastic in this presentation. So bear with me. Uh, this is the Black Pines Water System. This has been ongoing for, for quite some time. We have Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program, Rural and Northern Communities. <laughs> Uh, for the Pritchard Community Water System Membrane um, Filtration Plant. And then we have the Community Works Benefit Fund and the Canada Community Building Fund for the conversion of the Pritchard Community Sewer Treatment Facility to a membrane bioreactor. So those are three large projects. Um, then we have uh, funded solely through Canada Community Building Funds. We have the Paul Lake Community Wastewater System, and this was board approved in December 2021. Uh, for upgrades to the lift station and uh, communications at the Paul Lake lift, um, wastewater treatment facility. And then we have the Loon Lake community water system, which was uh, part of a larger um, automatic transfer switch program for six communities, uh, community water systems, which was originally approved in November and then amended in March, 2022. Uh, this is $18,000 for um, an automatic transfer switch. Then we have some other funding sources, and this is Vave B. So the preliminary design for the Vave B water treatment facility, this was funded through donations um, from Trans Mountain, as well as from the Canfor. So this is just a summary table, um, and this will be in the minutes as well, so that you can uh, review just a higher level overview of the funding sources and the amounts, as well as the current status of these projects. There we go. So this, the sum of the funding right now, of these capital projects is about $8.5 million. So this is down from about 9.3 of the last um, capital update. So our current projects, we'll go through them one by one here. Black Pines Community System, we tendered this, um, sorry, we did a detailed design and tendered it in June, 2022, awarded the contract in August, 2022, and the contractor mobilized in October, um, about a year ago now, and commenced earthworks. So the building was completed in January. This was slightly behind schedule to do um, some well issues and whatnot, and some weather issues. And then the mechanical work was substantially complete in May 2023. So this is pretty straightforward. Couple, there's two wells. Um, they were artesian. 
we elevated significant earthworks to bring the level of the building up above the floodplain and the 200 year um, elevation. So you can see in this photo here that we have one well that's capped. This is the well that was installed in 2017 and was failed to, we failed to screen it um, with delays with the project. We weren't able to install a screen. So it's has a reduced capacity for pumping to avoid um, drawing sand into the system. The other one that is currently connected um, in this photo here, which is actually shut off right now, is the primary well, which was put in in 2021. And then we have the, the flow meters and all the ancillary equipment in there. So the electrical installation is ongoing through the summer. And now essentially everything is ready. We just need some power. So as you're aware, there were some fires this summer that um, damaged a lot of BC hydro infrastructure. And so I think that took priority. This is just speculation that it took priority over um, giving the Black Pines community a new electrical service. But uh, the service was disconnected last Friday. So it allows our contractor to continue on with the uh, installation of the electrical components in the system. So we're pushing to commission this over the next um, three weeks. And we will be using our portable backup or portable generator to provide power while we await hydro, um, the connection of the, of the three phase to this system. So this, for those of you that aren't um, too familiar with it, I know we covered a lot of stuff in the overview um, a couple months back, but this system is actually um, on the same parcel as the transfer station in Black Pines. And so there was single phase power there previously with a pole, a private pole. And now we have to take that single phase to three phase power. Um, so that's the, and the location of the pole in relation to the um, transfer station building and access to it, there's certain requirements around that for setbacks. And so we have to make some adjustments to the site to allow hydro to actually access the infrastructure. So that's causing us some delays as well. But good news is, is the, the concrete work, the um, mechanical work, everything else is, is ready to go. We will be, this is the wellhead cover um, for our primary well there. And then they will be flushing and disinfecting um, this week and starting next week for some witness tests. Um, so into, right into commissioning and then startup of this other system, which is um, great, great news for the, the community out there. So fortunately for us, we received a grant extension um, and we asked for six months and they gave us two years. So uh, that was quite, quite fortunate for us. Um, and our water license is being um, is being bumped up as far as reviewing. It's a, a new water license. So there is a fair bit of work on this one as well, whether we amend our existing water license or apply for a new one. Um, it's been ongoing for a few years now. And um, for those of, of you familiar with the groundwater regulations, all wells have to be licensed. Um, now so there's a quite a large queue for the ministry to work through and they're looking at these ones that service community water systems and giving them a little bit higher priority than uh maybe a domestic or irrigation well um so that's currently under review we expect to have that i don't know in the next year or so that's black pines <clears throat> so we have our pritchard community water system this one, um, as you may recall, we obtained a 100% um, grant fund, $4.95 million for this project. This was applied for in 2018. We received the grant in 2019, started in 2020. And we awarded the contract for the design and the construction services. So this is for a consulting engineer to design the system and manage the construction of it in November, 2020. The preliminary design and membrane supply was completed in 2021. Detailed design was completed and the contract construction contract was tendered in November, 2022. The tenders were 2.1 million to $3 million higher than our available funding. So that's the joke for the day right there. Um, <laughs> Uh, so something obviously went wrong. Uh, we obviously had 
pandemic in there that uh, um, created some price issues and whatnot. So what we did is we we engaged a third party consultant to review this project. Um, and then we came back to the board and requested and the board approved an additional $1.05 million from the Growing Communities Fund to complete this project. That was in July of this year. So um, after that, subsequent to that, we terminated the engineering consultant and hired a new engineering group for this project. So I was looking for the quote and I couldn't find out if, couldn't confirm whether it was attributed to Einstein or not, but the um, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, insanity. Um, I was gonna throw that one up here. I figured I'd just talk about it instead. So we, um, rather than trying to do it over and over and over the same thing, expecting it to come in cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, we have gone in a different direction on this. So we adjusted the scope and we're redesigning the system. We are using some of the um, initial design that was completed by the previous consultant and trying to find some efficiencies in there. We're also working with the membrane um, supplier and equipment supplier to, um, to review some efficiencies there. As well, there was an expectation that this membrane equipment would be supplied in 2021 to 2022. And we had an escalation clause in, in that contract. And now we're just looking to confirm that and work through those details. So the other piece that we did with this, which we'll talk about next is the wastewater treatment plant upgrade. And so we also are going to find some efficiencies by aligning these two projects, um, the water treatment plant membrane, as well as the upgrade to the wastewater treatment facility in Pritchard, which are on the same parcel of land. So if we can do procurement together and construction management together, we can find some efficiencies there. So, you know, to, if you want lots of pictures in the presentation, you have to wait for the operations update, sorry. But, um, <laughs> so our Pritchard community sewer system, this is a bioreactor upgrade right now. Um, we have a, a system that's at the end of its life. This is um, asset renewal is required here, requires replacement. On top of that, replacing like for like doesn't seem like the appropriate choice, given that we've had historical compliance issues with this with this treatment facility and meeting the, the mystery environment discharge guidelines. So I know I went through this stuff well, actually, this is probably just in a board report previously, but um, this is the current trickling filter. And this is actually the best section we have of it. Uh, this um, It's essentially sheet metal that keeps all the wastewater inside the, the media. And if you were to walk down here, you're going to get covered in, in wastewater because it has holes in it and everything else. And the cost to replace it is is quite high. So we did that cost a uh, comparison of replacing like for like and it, and also upgrading the system to a, a more robust system that would meet the requirements and um, came back to the board and, and requested funding and received it. So reviewed those options with the consultant, defined the scope and the cost estimate, and then the board approved back in July again, the $2.15 million for this project. So that's funded by both the... Um, Canada Community Building Funds, as well as the Growing Community Fund. And then the remainder will be covered by reserves for the uh, wastewater treatment facility. So our current wastewater facility, um, primary tanks where all the, the, the initial screenings settle out, we have a screening system headworks, which will work very well to protect the membrane downstream. And then we have a trickling filter. So this is what's pictured up here. This trickling filter is what we're proposing to replace with a, a membrane plant and use most of this tankage as well and essentially eliminate this whole piece right in here uh, and these filters. So that's our current flow diagram. Um, so we've confirmed the work plan with the consultant and we've started the design with the intention to um, align procurement with the Pritchard Water treatment uh, facility project. So this is what our, our initial uh, design looks like. 
So we are utilizing the, this is the current footprint of the, of the wastewater facility in Pritchard minus the headworks building over here, which will remain unchanged. Convert these, the first tank into the equalization tank, convert another one into a sludge holding tank. These two, this is currently our effluent. So all of our treated effluent ends up in this tank right now. This would be an aeration basin. And then we replace the trickling filter tank, um, put a baffle in there and add two membrane, um, two membrane sets for redundancy and then relocate our, our current UV system that we have in there and reuse some of that. So this whole footprint already exists. There's a building uh, outline here already and we would reuse the mechanical electrical areas for it. So we're looking for fairly efficient design on this one. Uh, Paul Lake sewer system. So we did a communication upgrade there. So the board approved $109,000 for this. We ordered the pumps in May, 2022. They arrived in January, 2023. This project was completed in March, 2023. So. Um, for those of you familiar with the Paul Lake area, installing pumps and doing work outside in January is not the most desirable time, especially when you need to run and do conduits for some level sensors and whatnot. So uh, fortunately, our, our contractor um, overcame the obstacles and and managed to get this, this system up and running. And it's been working quite well and everyone's um, quite happy with it. So we've renewed the pumps in the system as well as the controls on it. So we've taken the, an asset that was at the end of its life as well and, and renewed it too, so. And then we had our, our automatic transfer switch um, project. So the board approved $127,000 in gas tax or CCPF um, back in 2021. And we, um, awarded an installation contract in 2022 after we procured all the equipment. And so five of the six installs were complete. So Evergreen, Del Oro, Maple Mission, Savannah, Wallachie, and all have automatic transfer switches um, installed. And then the generator was configured as well to connect them. So you can see here, these are all color-coded attached to the transfer switch. This is a Savanaugh example. So this is our only external transfer switch. There was no room inside the building to put it. So it went outside in a rated enclosure. We have cables here. These connect to the other end of the, they're all color coded. So we tried to make it as, as simple as possible. Green goes to green, red goes to red. Um, <laughs> and then these are the boxes that match up with our generator as well. So the generator is pretty straightforward and you just have a, a dial on there to change the, the voltage um, to match up with the system. And I'll let Mr. Horton talk more about that as operational update. So uh, Loon Lake automatic transfer switch has not been ordered yet. The last um, quote we received on this and one of the reasons this one uh, waited and is still pending is that um, it was approved back in March. There was no funding available um, in November 21. So we had to wait until 2022 to, to receive funding for it. And then we ran into supply chain issues. So now we are looking at 33 to 35 weeks for an equivalent transfer switch um, as for delivery for that, which is not a short time. That's another, what, nine months or so. So we're looking at alternative options for transfer switch there. And in the meantime, we've also looked at we received a planning grant for Loon Lake for another option as well. So it's one of those pieces of this larger project that's just kind of um, on hold at this point until we have a, a larger, until we look at the overall projects um, for Loon Lake. So. Can I just ask a question? The automatic transfer switch, is that emergency backup power or what is it for? Yes. Yeah, so good question. The emergency or the, sorry, the automatic transfer switches. So in the event of a power outage, um, for instance, Blue River likes to have power outages. Um, we can take our generator, our portable generator, or we can go rent one and we can haul it out to site, plug it into this and turn it on. Once this trans, this automatic transfer switch will confirm that the power is adequate for it and flip the power over 
and then run the this, this system when there is no um, utility power, PC hydro power. So it is for emergency situations. And we have one generator available that will run the majority of our systems. It will run Savanaugh, but it's an awful lot of manual work to run Savanaugh because the generator is undersized for it. So we can't run all the pumps and stuff. But uh, for the rest of our systems, it will run that. We can take it out there, plug it in, and let it let it go. So. And on the Black Pines commissioning, uh, is the same generator going to be used for the Black Pines commissioning? Yes. Yep. So the, the final project we had here, this was the other funding one, um, was our Baven B water system pre-design. And this is, uh, yeah, this is a recycled slide from previous reports or uh, presentations. So. We had uh, True Consulting completed the preliminary design in June 2022, so just over a year ago. We fast-tracked that preliminary design to um, align with a grant application intake. Uh, our cost estimate came in around $5.3 million, which exceeded the, the grant intake. And so well, then we, we went back to the, the drawing board on this one, not, not so much the drawing board, but what steps were fast tracked that were that were skipped or um, you know put off for later and said let's let's take care of these. So our the recommendations were for the environmental permitting summary that's complete, and then geotechnical investigations for the building as well as for the infiltration basins to deal with the um, the residuals. Um, and that is complete as well. So the only outstanding work is a AOA or archaeological um, work on this project. So this will further um, advance this preliminary design and make it um, a much better uh, submission for a future grant program. And as mentioned, the funding sources for this pre-design were the Trans Mountain Expansion Project and the Canfor Legacy donation. So. So what's next? Because that's not enough. Um, <laughs> planning grants. So this prepares us for the future. So we, we've we applied for multiple planning grants and we've completed the Wallachine Reservoir Replacement um, Study. So this was looking at the options for replacing the reservoir in Wallachine. Now, the Wallachine Reservoir currently sits between... <laughs> Between the, the community of Wallachine and the reservoir, there's a quarry um, from CP and there's a railway line. And the elevation of the existing reservoir is um, it's quite elevated over the community and requires multiple pressure reducing valves to control that, that pressure. Um, so we looked at different options for it and have a, a conceptual layout and preferred option now that's grant ready. And the cost estimate for that replacement is $1.2 million. So the other thing to mention about our existing reservoir in Wallachine is that it is a lined basin. So similar to what Savannah used to have for their treated water, um, it's a dugout lagoon with a, um, a liner in it and a liner over top of it, a cover, a floating cover. This floating cover is failing. Um, the more we go on this cover to make repairs, the more damage we actually cause. So at this point, we are just trying to keep that cover floating uh, and preventing it from sinking. And fortunately, it, it stores raw water. So it's not like we're putting potable water into a reservoir and then hoping that the mice don't find it and get pumped into the system. We're putting raw water straight from the river, so uh, the Thompson, into this reservoir. And then as people use the water, it gets treated through a filtration system. So that's a, a completed project we did through this planning grant. Um, and for those of you not familiar with the planning grants, they're they're fairly small. They're um, the the way the phrase it I guess is that we spend five thousand dollars and the province kicks in another ten. So they're about fifteen to twenty thousand um, dollar planning grants that we apply for, and it um, saves a fair bit of of money for it gets us a lot more um 
be a lot more for the five thousand dollars we spend than if we don't apply for it or have to find that that fifteen thousand dollars from the community. So they're they're pretty handy that way. So I kind of went a little bit crazy and started applying for a bunch of them, and turns out we got a bunch. So <laughs> these will just um, they're they're advancing our master plan items. And they're preparing us for future grants as well as what are our options and what's next for these community water systems. So uh, we have a Paul Lake Community Water System Feasibility Study. This is currently in progress. So we were approached by the, um, the owners um, for acquisition. So we're following our acquisition strategy. And this will assess the infrastructure, review the financials, permits, any required upgrades, and it also determine the long-term operating budgets and capital replacement needs. The results of this will be taken back to that community um, and brought back to the, the community and the board as well prior to any acquisitions. So this is follows our, our strategy and um, we received a, a grant to partially offset the cost for that. Uh, another one of these ones we just received, the Evergreen Groundwater. So this one's in progress. Evergreen's our smallest community water system. There's 16 connections there. And we have uh, issues with access to our intake. So our intake sits outside the service area. We have to access private property to get to our intake. It's kind of an orphaned parcel. And we take water from the North Thompson and yes. we don't treat it. So there's a high cost to treat um, to the 43210 objectives. And so the one of the thoughts is that let's ex, let's explore for ground for groundwater in Evergreen. So similar to to Black Pines, right? We were treating North Thompson, and we wanted to put another intake in. The community came back and said, "No, thank you." So we started exploring for groundwater in Black Pines, and guess what we found? <laughs> right, a pretty secure source. So the thought is Evergreen may have the same option. There is an existing well in Evergreen, a private well used for irrigation. Um, on the south end of the community. And so with that in mind, we approached the the consultants to, is this a feasible option and came up with a, a planning grant, applied for that, received it, and it's currently underway. So, uh, Loon Lake Water Filling Station, this one I quite like. Um, <laughs> I like them all, but this one is one of my favorites right now. So in Loon Lake, this is a very seasonal system. I've can't recall if it's one or two full-time residents up there out of 52. Uh, and we have water quality issues. So they are on a boil water notice right now. And they will be until we have a, a permanent solution. Simply because there's elevated turbidity, but also manganese. So uh, the manganese is elevated above the maximum acceptable concentration. So Interior Health Authority um, has us put a boil water notice on and also a notification saying... Do not use this water for infants. So um, it's not safe to use for for, um, for that. So essentially it's great right now for irrigating and for maybe bathing. Um, and because we have such a seasonal customer base here, this is one of the um, rate reviews that we're trying to wrap our heads around too for the next meeting. How are we going to do consumption-based billing in Loon Lake when there's people there for three months of the year? And that's it. Um, turns into a pretty astronomical rate if you do it that way. So that's one of the ones we'll bring at the next meeting. But also the feasibility of installing um, right now is what we're, what we're looking at is what if we put in, <clears throat> excuse me, a water fill station for the community. So if we take our existing infrastructure and run a pipe off of it, run it through a, a small scale treatment system, into a bottled water fill station that's accessible with something like uh, similar to the eco cards that the TNRD currently uses where the, the community can come down there and fill up their five gallon water jug and use that for drinking water. So that's one of the options we're looking at right now. Um, and that's what this, uh, this grant is, is for. And so this, we just received these, I think, Two weeks ago so we're really at the preliminary stages of these two the evergreen and the loon lake planning so <laughs> and then our final one is the cepf grant so this is 
what I like to say, the previous one was or, uh, preparing for the future. This one is facing reality. So this picture here is our <laughs> Black Pines intake right now. Very, um, <laughs> very secure water source right there. You can see, can't see that well, but, and, and Mick has more pictures of this that he talked about more um, in the next presentation, but this little pond um, of the North Thompson, which is fed by a little tiny stream off a of back eddy with some dead fish in here is where our intake is right now for, for black pines. So this is just an example of, of what's happening um, with our drought levels and whatnot in, in BC. So this grant, this is a great acronym. Oh, this is a community emergency preparedness fund disaster risk reduction, climate adaptation. Um, this one was actually brought to our attention by the by our consultant that said, hey, this project that you're talking about for drought might actually fit into here. So this is a, a grant that we are currently applying for. And there is a, a report going to the board this afternoon for a, a board resolution for this. Um, and this is basically looking at drought risk and infrastructure resiliency assessment for all of our community water systems. So what exactly does that mean? <laughs> means that we're going to define the drought risk for each community water system and analyze the climate and expected climate change impacts. So this is going to look out over quite a few years using a lot of different information available to the hydrogeologists um, and see what kind of impacts it, it could have or is expected to have on our community water systems, our source water supply. Um, it will also identify mitigation measures that we may need to implement. So these would be things like um, water restrictions. I think everyone's fairly familiar with what happened in, in Kamloops this year. Uh, following the drought response, no outdoor water use, can't wash your cars in your driveway. We actually received phone calls at the TNRD from local communities around surrounding Kamloops can I wash my car? And it's like, yes, you can. So we're looking at, at the localized impacts. Um, the, the provincial drought response looks at, you know, provincial level, and then you have larger municipalities like the, the city of Kamloops, um, village of Ashcroft that are receiving letters from the stewardship branch to reduce their um, withdrawals. So it may be that, you know, the TNRD community systems are less than a drop in the bucket when it comes to, you know, any impacts on, on the environment or, or drought. But this project is designed to look at this and also what impacts will this drought have on our community water systems and determine any future system specific design and structural improvement needs. So the, the interesting thing I find with this grant is that it's set up in three different phases. So the first one is planning, the next one is I think more planning and design. And then the, the third one is, is structural. What kind of structural components are required to make your system more drought resistant or resistant to climate adaptation, um, disaster resiliency, right? So, or risk reduction. So how do we continue to provide this service to the communities? And that's what this grant um, that we would like to apply for, if you approve it <laughs> this afternoon, is, is all focused on. Uh, this will align with the provincial drought response and prepare us for the future. The price tag on this one is $146,000, give or take, so up to a maximum of $150,000, um, and that's 100% funded through this grant program. So if we're successful, we would receive up to $150,000 to do this work. And this is expanding on our master planning that was completed in 2018. And looking at, um, and we're also preparing for a opening up a different pathway for for future grants through this program as well, which may allow us to apply for um, grants to uh, add additional intakes or alternate sources, um, secure the the water for the water systems. So for the community, I'm pretty excited about this one, and I'm very uh, pleased that our our consultant brought this to our attention that this project that we were talking about briefly, you know, when the, when the city of Canada's news release went out, I was like, Oh boy, <laughs> what questions am I going to get? So I called our consultant and said, Hey, I kind of need something. And 
and their their response was do you want something political or do you want something technical and i said how about both and they're like this is what we can do for you and oh by the way as we're looking at this project this grant program is available too for you so do you want to go ahead with it and i'm like sure and they're like okay it's doing eight days i'm like hmm huh. okay and they got her done um and i do want to acknowledge that um uh, Kim McMillan, our grants coordinator, put an awful lot of effort into this uh, grant to get it prepared and uh, did a fantastic job working with our consultant to get all the information through while our utilities department was working on other projects. So I think it was it's amazing. So Tyrone, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, if you could bring up that last slide with the picture, uh, that's you said the black pines, but that's the well, right? That is not the well. That is current our current intake that we are using to supply water. That's the current intake. That's the river. That's standing on the river bank um, on the sandbar in Black Pines. So if I've got it correct, we're switching over to a well system in Black Pines? Yes, we are. So we're not trying to fix this problem. Uh, we're, we're about to commission a well system that replaces this problem. That's correct. So uh, I picked this picture as an example of the drought conditions, um, the the ro low river levels, and the risk to our our water source in our current communities, and fortunately for us, yeah, Black Pines is should be coming online before we run out of water. But that's a should. It's not a. It will. It's a should. There's potential still. So, any questions for Tyrone on this discussion? <laughs> thank you chair director style <laughs> thank you chair um can we get a copy of those that presentation okay thank you um and then so the um i noticed yeah pritchard new wastewater uh treatment system it looks like a you know pretty substantial upgrade and change to the uh design um i'm just wondering if our um, current process for design studies is there any component um forecasting additional uh, operating costs because of the upgrades and then uh, if we have the staffing like the certification and such to um, you know if we have the people um, ready to take it over thank you yes thank you um we do consider the the cost of the the operations of the new systems before we put them in and weigh those against the the over so they look at the overall cost of the system not just the capital but also the um, ongoing operations and as far as the the technical requirements for the operator that's a an interesting one so our current workforce is we have three um, operators right now that are all going to reach retirement age in the next three to seven years um, they've been with the TNRD with our department for 15 to 15 plus and Yes, we will. There will be struggles for sure um, to deal with the tech, new technologies, and I've personally seen this in multiple communities. Um, I can use, you know, the city of San Arm as an example, where I worked. Um, they received a grant, built a new water filtration plant, but previous to that, they had pumped water out of the out of the lake, and all their operators that were there for multiple years were certified in distribution, not in in treatment. And so I was a, it was very rare that I, I was hired as a chief operator there, not having actually been an internal candidate because I had the, the tickets to, to run that system. So do I, I think that's going to be an issue for us here? I don't think it'll be a, a huge issue. I myself have the, the skills required to operate these systems, not desirable um, to have the manager running the systems, but we can provide training um, to the right candidates as well, and try and find those those um, those staff that have those those skills for the future. So, Director Hodden, thanks, uh, Chair um, Tyrone and, and Jamie. We had a discussion earlier on in the in in our my our my, my mandate here down at the uh, Mission Flats office regarding the Del Oro water system and, and the different um well the constraints to it i guess is, is there's a few there's the quantity of water that can be pumped and then 
access to the reservoir and that kind of a thing. But we talked briefly on the water quality part and you mentioned that there was a contraption, I'll just use that term, that we could install in these 45 houses because it's a very small system and to put in a big fancy water treatment system for 45 doesn't make sense. Is, is there a way in our system of of grants and, and supplying is, could we look at supplying these, I'll use the term contraptions, for these 45 households that would meet some kind of water quality standard better than what they have today and and without spending millions of dollars on 45 households? Is there a, a way through the system that we could accommodate these 45 folks? I'll try first on this one. Um, so I believe the TNRD, um, previous to the this current Black Pines project, examined point of use and point of entry treatment for communities, uh, for Black Pines specifically. And the issues come around to ownership of the system and I believe you know, liability issues. So if we were to go install 45 or 42 or however many it is point of use systems, we would then have to also maintain those and sample them um, and whatnot. So is it a, uh, a, a, solu a viable solution for the TNRD to do that? Maybe not, but is there a mechanism to um, promote you know, users to do that? Maybe. Uh, either way, uh, unless the TNRD did it, we would still be subject to IHA um, requirements for boil water notices, water quality advisories, and whatnot. So as far as the funding of that and how to fund, you know, personal residences to do that, I'll leave that to somebody else. So, Yeah, I, I agree with Tyrone. And um, and this discussion, you know, this, this the concept is is reasonable, um, and the discussion that uh, Director Houghton and Tyrone and I had about it was kind of just this brainstorming idea. And uh, I guess to summarize, yeah, I, what Tyrone said was correct: is that we couldn't own and operate individual systems within households, but because of the unique nature of our systems and how small they are, um, we're not giving up on thinking outside the box of how something like that could work um but it would have to be uh, like i said a thinking outside the box scenario where it would be some sort of incentive or support for the individual to own um you know technology within their home that in, that improved their own water quality um and then our what we are providing is what comes through the pipe and then what they have in the house is what improves their their water quality um, but yes, you're absolutely right to, to summarize. Um, the unfortunate reality is a treatment plant in some of these small systems and the cost of it is without, you know, significant grant funding. In many cases, 100% grant funding is just not economically viable. So um, we're not giving up on that concept, but it, would, it, it wouldn't it would fit within current sort of standard models. That's, that's the take home, I guess. Thank you. Dr. Morris. Thank you. Um, I won't go through the whole list of questions that are rattling through my mind, I promise. Um, but a couple of things come to mind and, and clearly Area P is fairly impacted um, on this one. Um, just a simple question on this one, um, this drought impact assessment uh, opportunity would, in the process of going through that as TNRD, we'll also be looking at what the impact of some of the private intakes. I'm I'm using the South Thompson River and its lack of any water, frankly, um, and, as an example. So are will we include that into it, the assessment of what water use is looking like? Short answer is no, we're not going to look at directly those intakes. However, there'll likely be information in those reports that in some cases would be helpful to those individual users. Okay. So for example, if there's an intake kilometer downstream, they could, you know, we, we could provide that same information, our, our data to those private systems. So they're aware of what, what information we're collecting. Okay, thank you. So second question, um, 
the conversation briefly around consumption based fees and whatnot. Um, this is a long term concept that we're possibly looking at, and that might include, for example, the people that are tote dwellers, as I call them, um, the people that are literally, you know, to have the large totes and that kind of thing, that whole consumption piece of, of intake will come into something in the future to talk about. Um, maybe I misunderstand the question, but just to clarify, so our current fees are already consumption based. So we switched to meter grade billing this year. Oh. The bylaw that sets those meter grades is expiring at the end of this year. So we're reviewing that bylaw and provide and uh, and bringing in updated rates. So December. that decision has already been made to go to metered rates. We flipped the switch on all the systems except one this year. And so residents are already on a user pay system. Okay, so it's tied directly to the resident. Correct, it's okay. tied directly to the water meter. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, the third one that I will pose, um, Overall, we're talking about a long-term acquisition strategy, essentially. So that's partly what we're going to be looking forward to the future as well. Is that right? I was sort of hearing some conversation about that. As far as the acquisition strategy goes, we have a water system sustainability and acquisition strategy. Um, and we are following that when we were approached um, by a community in Paul Lake to take over their water system. So... Yeah, we aren't looking right now at, at revamping that strategy. So, okay. So, other systems with Paul Lake <laughs> was on my mind, obviously. Um, Evergreen might be the same. As far as acquisition goes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or we already have that one. We already own. Okay. The Thank you. So, uh, sorry. Sorry. I was wrong on that one. Thank you very much. And, and just a point of clarity on that, um, just because I think people, in, especially in the public, hearing the term that we have an acquisition strategy, it's not that we're actively out trying to acquire, and that's our strategy. It's that the strategy is when groups come to us and request that we would take them on, this, this is the strategy, is what we follow in terms of our policy to what we would consider taking so on. This part is a quiet conversation, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Thank you very much. CAO uh, Hildebrand? Yeah, just one other point of clarification. That's a board decision. So everything Jamie said is 100% accurate, but it is a board decision. So if, if an acquisition proposal came towards us, the staff did the work, the board would make that decision, not, not staff. Uh, Jim? Thank you, Chair. Uh, just getting back to the uh, automatic switching mechanism, what uh, is the timeline for deployment, for instance, to uh, to Wallachine for a time for a power outage? How soon are you going to get at it? It's a, a great question. Um, so I can go back to some history we have. Um, a couple of decisions I got to make a couple of years back, but um, Blue River is the best example I have. The uh, we deployed a generator during a power outage and they turned around a little fort because the power would come back on. The next time, I think it was a couple of weeks later, it happened. We're like, okay, we'll wait till the morning. Well, they ran out of water at 5 a.m. So <laughs> that's a, an operational decision uh, based on the information we can gather, conversations with hydro, how long the outage is going to be. If, for instance, Blue River, it takes us about four hours to get a generator there. By the time we decide to go make the decision, get it hooked up, get it up there, connect it, it's, it's four hours. Wallachine, I would say probably close to two hours to get there. Um, and each system is, is slightly different. And it also depends on how wide um, broad that power outage is and who's affected in the, the prioritizing the responses. So. So you do get probably do get pretty accurate information from hydro as any anybody can get online uh, as to when the power is going to get back put back on. Yeah, just like everybody else, we look on the outage map and they determine that the crews on site assigned or expected time on and sometimes it's it's on an hour before that sometimes it's within minutes and sometimes it's hours, <laughs> maybe even a day after so yeah. 
And just to follow up to that, a couple of points, um, each system, and Tyrone, you could speak to this more if I I'm, I'm mess anything up, each system's, uh, you know, unique in terms of the storage capacity and usage, and then the staff will be monitoring what the reservoir levels look like. So um, that also factor into the operational decision of when to deploy of how much water is in the reservoir and when they're going to run out, um, or when we think they're going to run out. Um, the other piece, just a, a teaser that will be discussed in um, in the next presentation is around the Blue River system. We keep using that one as an example, but we're getting really close to getting a permanent generator on site there so that uh, the temporary generator won't, or the um, portable generator wouldn't be deployed up there um, and because they'll have a permanent one in place. Director Sal. Thank you, Chair. Um, speaking of generators, um, do we have a policy on uh, like potentially renting those out to municipality? Like, because um, I know Clearwater, whenever they have power outage, um, they just pretty much send out a um, you know reserve water advisory to on a voyant alert system to residents. Um, I wonder if we can turn that generator in like kind of like an, a revenue asset, kind of like a fire protection trailers. <laughs> I, um, as far as renting out to municipalities, I mean, if for whatever reason Clearwater was affected, but Vavenby, Blue River, other systems on the North Thompson weren't, and they needed something right quick, perhaps we could explore that. They called us, but that generator is here simply for backup power to our 11 water systems um, that don't have backup power. And more often than not, when clear water's out, blue river's out. Um, and we've continuously drove by Vavenby with the generator while Vavenby's out of water, simply because going back to Jamie's response about the, the storage and requirements there. So, you know, if there's a longer term outage, then we would have to um, go to Vavenby and, and use it elsewhere and also go and secure rentals as well. So the, the intent of the portable generator was for an immediate reaction um, to go deal with the issue. And then we would go and, and procure a, a replacement for that so we can deploy it elsewhere. So. I have a question. Um, is there any, I didn't see anything on Savinal water treatment and I'm wondering if we have anything uh, in the works for an application for water treatment for Savinal in 2024. Um. Uh, no, we don't have anything in 2024. The Savannah pre-design is um, basically shelf ready and complete. So um, I guess to be blunt, the waiting game now is a grant uh, opportunity that would, would fit that project, meaning a big enough dollar amount uh, for funding to fit that opportunity. The other thing to keep in mind with um, Savannah specifically is we um, already have, the community is already paying down a debt for the reservoir replacement. Um, and last time we were in the community specifically to talk to that, we um, you know, did a straw poll to ask the level of interest for additional borrowing. So for example, if a grant opportunity 80% funded, would the community support doing another referendum for additional borrowing? And at that time, we were four years ago when we did that not too long ago it was overwhelmingly no wait for the answer was no we don't want to borrow anything more wait for a hundred percent grant opportunity so those do come along that was what the grant we received in Pritchard but again it's just um, having a grant opportunity that fits the project so that's the Savannah one specifically the dollar amount high enough and the hundred percent funding or other funding you know that could be combined with a, a grant Anything after that, Tyrone? Seven? No. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions? Because uh, we can move on to operations, I guess. Morning, everyone. Uh, I didn't get an opportunity to meet everybody uh, in the last meeting. Uh, Mick Horton is my name, uh, utility supervisor. 
Uh, I'm going to be going through kind of our operations update for um, our systems this year. I was just going to go in my year to date, just run through uh, system by system, give you a quick update on each system, kind of some of the challenges that we're facing in each system. And then some uh, highlights on uh, certain systems and some of the projects we're working on, uh, what's upcoming, and then we'll have a question period at the end. Uh, so year to date, we're going to start in Black Pines, uh, alphabetical order, not by importance or anything like that. <clears throat> so this is the intake, as Tyrone talked about. Um, not a whole bunch of water up there. Uh, we yearly have freeze ups on this intake as well. So there's issues long term here. Um, the pump post will remain as a backup system in this system. So the well will be the prime primary. And then we will maintain this system as a backup system in case a well fails at any point. Uh, so there's a little bit of work that will need to be done to this system uh, moving forward, but uh, generally the system's in good order besides the uh, water supply. <clears throat> Blue River, um, that's the generator in question. That's the one that we tow all over the place. Um, uh, Blue River's kind of two stories this year. One is generators and trying to get a generator system up there. Uh, I think I think this year we've done four like emergency drives with our generator partway there. Um, so we're we're currently in the process of putting in a generator pad there. Uh, the second story in Blue River is uh, the AC pipe that is in the ground there. Uh, the connections that uh, we have there continue to uh, be an issue. Um, they are uh, tapped right now and they pull out quite easily with all the construction that's gone on in Blue River. Uh, we've had quite a, quite a few repairs there this year. So that's kind of my Blue River story. Uh, Deloro, uh, this year in the spring, we had, uh, we had an issue with our intake. Um, so we brought the divers in to clean the intake and inspect the intake. Uh, the intake wasn't actually the issue. The issue was the drought. So our pump was not far enough in the river to actually pull water out of the river anymore. So we did some work. We uh, put an extension piece into our suction piping and pushed that pump further out into the river to get it into the river for, um, and we haven't had an issue with it for the rest of the year. So we, we pushed the pump out two more feet into the river and it's maintaining right now. So. Uh, evergreen, uh, I don't really have any evergreen updates. Uh, pretty uh, pretty late work in evergreen this year. Um, kind of the only thing that is on the books at evergreen is the number two pump that's in our pump post right now is currently not operational. We have an issue there. Um, like Tyrone discussed, we're looking at uh, putting in a well there as well. So hopefully get out of that pumping situation we have. Uh, Little Fort, uh, Little Fort, very small system in Little Fort. Um, we just have a small little treatment system in the community center only for the community center itself. Uh, we had some UV repairs that we had to do there this year. And then we increased the size of our, uh, our tank in the washroom there. The little blue tank in the first picture up in the top left corner. The top one? that little blue tank there, we replaced with a much bigger tank to uh, make that system better this year. Uh, Loon Lake. Uh, um, yeah, systems in good order in Loon Lake. We don't really have any issues there at all. Maple Missions. Uh, we have uh, two wells in Maple Missions. Uh, we did a recondition on the number two well this year. So both wells there are in good shape. Pumps are in good shape. Uh, we've had uh, an issue with some flow meters that we've been working through this year. Uh, we put a new flow meter in in November of 22. Uh, we're currently working through some warranty issues with Siemens on it. It's been malfunctioning. So it's minor little things, but. Uh, Pritchard, water. Um, we... Um, added a connection to Pritchard this year. And this particular um, picture that you see is 1356 Bostock. We added that connection this year. Uh, Pritchard, as you can see, is nothing but mud. Everywhere you go in Pritchard and Dig, it is mud. 
The, um, in the spring, we, in the high water levels, um, our meter boxes in certain areas of that neighborhood actually fill all the way up because the water table is so high. So we see like saturation everywhere. So it's, it's, it's quite, uh, quite difficult to do digs there and, and, uh, and work in that material. Uh, Savannah this year has actually been really, really quiet. We did some pump work early in the year. Um, we installed AC into this building this year. Um, uh, I had one, one emergency repair there for a water leak and we did some hydrant work there this year. It was, uh, it was a good year in Savannah to date. Spence's bridge. Uh, this is a picture of the, uh, the temporary or the, the backup intake at Spence's bridge. Um, we got, uh, we got three well pumps there feed into the two water systems that uh, are in Spences Bridge, the Cook Ferry water system and the water systems that we maintain for Spences Bridge. Uh, work up there, we've been, uh, we've been doing a lot of sampling and checks in Spences Bridge. Uh, we've lost our contractor in Spences Bridge this year. So uh, we've had to use our, our in-house people to service Spences Bridge for the better part of this year. Uh, Vavenby, uh, a couple of repairs in Vavenby, and then I've got a slide in my next section around the filtration system upgrade that we did in Vavenby this year as well. Sorry, that's abolishing. Check your notes. <laughs> uh, yes, so in Vavenby this year, sorry, uh, we had uh, we only had one repair that we had to do in ground this year in Vavenby. And then we had to pull the number two pump out in Vavenby. Uh, we had some issues with that pump. The pump was actually uh, rattled itself apart. So we put the pump back together and it's currently running fine again, so. And Wallachine. Wallachine, a uh, couple of repairs in Wallachine. And then uh, we did a bunch of work on this filtration system uh, to upgrade uh, the filtration in Wallachine. So I've got a slide that we'll discuss a little further on that one. Paul Lake Community Waste System. Uh, Tyrone discussed the upgrades that we did in the pumping system there. Um, we also did a sludge pumping for the septic tanks on the properties there. We did 11 of the 20 that were scheduled in this year. Uh, we only got 11 of 20 due to uh, trying to find tanks and people not marking tanks. Um, in Pritchard, uh, this system is in poor condition. Uh, we have got sand filters offline right now. We have uh, the number three aeration pump has broken piping inside. We have a UV system that is currently offline awaiting repairs. We have a sludge tank that is currently broken and requiring repairs as well. So this is a lot of the reasoning why we are going to a new system here. Uh, just trying to keep this plant running right now is eating up all of my maintenance money just to just to keep things running. Uh, some of the highlights that we've been going through, uh, Blue River um, in July of 22. Uh, I don't know how it happened, but somebody decided that they wanted to hit this fire hydrant. So we used some standard drawings. We went up there, we did the dig, we did the install as per specifications and, uh, and completed the job uh, in-house. Uh, some of the water main issues in Blue River, um, we did uh, digs for water main breaks on Angus Horn, Stewart, uh, and Main Street. We were there pretty much all of July. July 11th, July 26th, August 3rd and 4th. And these are overnights most of the time there to try and try and maintain these jobs. We pulled out quite a few water meters in Blue River um, in the course of our jobs up there as well because the, uh, the meters freeze uh, where they were installed. Uh, and it just causes all kinds of issues for our contractor on site. So we 
pull the water meters out of the ground and we are installing them inside houses now to keep them thawed out and metering properly through the whole winter. Uh, this is the Blue River generator installation. This is, uh, we went up there, we dug, we put in all the conduit, we've uh, formed it all, we've got the rebar in place. Currently trying to figure out how to get concrete there. Um, it's a bit trouble, a bit of trouble trying to get anything to Blue River um, from Kamloops. Um, there's not a batch plant anywhere closer than Kamloops. So just having a little bit of trouble, we're having to pay for a Saturday delivery for our concrete for our generator. Um, but we went out uh, for some estimates with some companies on this job and they came back so high that we ended up just taking it on in-house to try and minimize some costs and make it so that we can get these generators in place. So this generator right here is an 80 kilowatt generator that is in Pritchard right now existing hooked up into our system that is our backup generator that runs Pritchard uh, sewer system. We are going to disconnect this one and we are going to move it to Blue River and install it as you see right there. Uh, and then the one above, the one that was uh, donated by Trans Mountain uh, is going to be installed in Pritchard. It's a 200 kilowatt system that will run our wastewater and our water treatment plant. Uh, the hope is that we have this project pretty much done by the end of November. So still just, if I wasn't here, I'd be on the phone calling people trying to get stuff done. So that's what we're working on. Uh, wall of Sheen. Um, so we used to, we used to run uh, this, we, we call these trains. So this line here is one train and this line here is a second train. Um, the old system that we had, had a single train that would split and go into the two here. Um, wasn't very effective. So we went and we moved these ones to here and we bought two new bigger filters um, to go in after. What this allows for is for uh, when train, when the North train plugs up, uh, operators just have to go there. They have to uh, move a couple of valves around and then the second train's good to go and we can usually get a week out of those trains depending on the time of year. Uh, and then they can go back and clean the filters and get the other train back in order whenever they need to. In the past, it was, uh, is you would basically, once they were plugged up, you'd have to go there and take a system down to do some cleanup and get the system back up in operation. So this has just given us some redundancy and provided some uh, better supply of water to the community. In the Pritchard uh, waste system, the sewer system, um, sorry, my picture's bad here. This is actually the slow mixer motor replacement that we had to do. That was not the one that we had to do. That one is right there. So this this motor went on us, um, I think it was January, early, early January, I think. So we had to uh, purchase a new one. Uh, this is the new one that we got. Uh, the problem was is that the, the new one came with a totally different mounting style than the old one. So we did some in-house engineering. It's not the best picture. It's high in sketch, but uh, it's all good. It worked out. That is what we ended up with, with our slow mixer motor installed on our new base. All, all done in-house. We did everything by ourselves. Uh, this is our infiltration pond. Uh, this is uh, what our pond looked like at the beginning of summer. Uh, so we ran this pond for the last year, is that? And then we, we flipped to our other pond. Uh, and then we got in there with our excavator and we cleaned this whole pond back up to its uh, original state, uh, pulled all the material out uh, to the sides, picked it up with our dump truck and hauled it away. These are the troughs that lead from the... Um, from the plant itself into here. So we've cleaned these up and reconditioned this uh, back to uh, spec. Uh, this year when I, uh, it was November of last year when I arrived here uh, and took this job, there was no work order system in place. There was a lot of notes on whiteboards. People had notes in their books, all kinds of things like that. So. I've created a, a work order system. So when the guys are out in the field, uh, they now have it on their phones and they can 
they can create a work order, say, hey, this valve doesn't work. Take a picture of that valve, uh, some details on that valve. You have options for ordering information, all that kind of stuff in there. They can do that out in the field, reports right back into the office. And then we have a good record of it. Uh, we have planning meetings now where we go through and we prioritize uh, the work for each system and plan that work out uh, on, we try and plan out two weeks in advance and try and keep, uh, keep ahead of it. Um, some of the stats on our work order system. So it was implemented in January. Um, so far we have over 300 inputs into the system from our operators in the field. Uh, we have completed over 70 work orders this year and we have realized a backlog of 230 jobs that we have not been able to accomplish. Uh, I think it's gonna be a really good way for us to keep up with the maintenance in our systems, but I think it's also gonna be a good way for us to look at uh, upcoming future expenditures and workforce requirements to accomplish this work. So system that we put in, uh, we're still working through some of the bugs with it, but uh, so far it's been successful. What's next? Kind of a rundown for the rest of the year. Uh, we gotta complete our yearly samples. Uh, kind of the next big thing for us is, us is uh, getting to some system flushing and some hydrants uh, for the fall. Try and get our hydrant maintenance and system flushing completed. Uh, we've got to winterize our pump house as treatment buildings. Um, and we've got a uh, cell two in Savannah we need to turn off. Water usage in Savannah fluctuates so much summer to winter. We have two cells in that reservoir. So we run only one cell through the winter as the usage doesn't require us to have, store that much treated water for, for the winter periods. And then in the spring, we'll turn the cell back on. Uh, we need to complete our warehouse restocking, um, go through our budgets, uh, go through our work order system, order a bunch of stuff that we need to do for repairs and get our warehouse back up to stock after a busy summer of doing repairs and pulling out of our warehouse. Uh, we have, uh, we got to get our plow in installed on our new truck. In our sewer system strategy, we are going to attempt to keep Pritchard running until we have a new plant built. <laughs> that's what we're going to do. <laughs> and then we're going to complete the generator installation in Blue River and Pritchard, hopefully, and get all this work done and make these systems good. Well, thank you for that uh, presentation. Uh, I think you said Mick, is it? Mick, yes. Mick, uh, yeah, thank you for coming to our committee and explaining that, taking us along for that ride. Uh, do we have any questions for Mick? Uh, <laughs> Director Hanslow. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your presentation and for all the work that's gone into Blue River this year. I know it's been um, many trips, like you had said. I'm just curious about the infrastructure in Blue River. If there was three waterline main breaks this year, what are we anticipating for the future? And is there uh, any? way of looking into the future and potentially replacing some of those lines. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. So the, uh, the I, I maybe stated it wrong. It, they were not main leaks as much as they were service um, issues. Uh, what happens is that the service uh, plug where they, where they drill that plug, uh, we get a, a minor leaks at them and then it wears that AC pipe. And then as that AC pipe wears right at that service, then we get a leak there. We've been going in and just replacing small sections of the AC pipe and replacing those services. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with the age of the infrastructure for sure. Um, but as to replacement of infrastructure, I think Tyrone has have a better idea on that. Yeah, so we have conditions assessment, condition assessments completed for our water system infrastructure and that's um, guides our our ten year capital plan, five year capital plan, and then the fun part is trying to find out how to fund it. So, for instance, um, this year in Blue River, uh, we realized a significant amount of revenue, miscellaneous revenue, 
from the Trans Mountain Camp and the water sold. And so we budgeted that about $200,000 to do a water main replacement for next year. So unfortunately, the pricing for water main replacement is somewhere between it at the very low end, the most simple way is $550 per meter. Uh, up to about a thousand dollars per meter. So we can budget to replace about 250 meters, you know, on a good day. Um, and there's, I don't know what the slide said from the previous presentations, but there's multiple kilometers of water main in Blue River. And this is an issue we have with all of our systems. So, um, and I know um, our CFO and I and Jamie have, have discussed this plenty of times, but we have these um, this these assets on our books from the 60s that had a value of you know $200,000 that are looking at now that over with inflation stuff are up to the you know million and a half dollars. But the actual replacement costs are going to be you know significantly more than that even um, you know five to ten million for the infrastructure that's currently in the ground. So we will continue to do what Mick is doing and repair them as they leak and more reactive than preventive on that. And we will, when we have the opportunity, like we do this year with the Trans Mountain um, revenue to uh, target specific locations and, and replace full mains there. So that one's still, it's on the books for next year and we'll um, talk to our consultants and look at our condition assessments and assess it based on priority, which which section of Maine will replace, so. Director Thorpe. Thank you, thanks. A couple of questions, I've got two actually. So the first one is Spence's Bridge. Uh, you showed a picture of the uh, backup system there. My understanding is that backup system is unusable, that it's plugged at the intake. Is that something that you've looked into or is that part of the backlog in our system right now? That's question one. So I, I'll take question one, uh, Murray Creek intake. Yes. So we are not, a, we're not sure whether it's usable or not. We suspect that it would take multiple days to uh, make it usable if we needed it. And we do have it on the, in the backlog right now of having it assessed um, and doing a further condition assessment on that intake and determine the viability of, of having that, maintaining that as a backup system or not. That will also be part of the, um, the review done under the CEPF application if we're successful and looking for the, the backup source. So that would be the, the drought resistance um, planning as well. So it is on the books to to look at and to um, assess further and come up with a plan to, to utilize it if we had to. Awesome, because that keeps being a question that yes. residents are asking me. Uh, second one, Wallachine. You've got the uh, two rail lines, as you call them now, because you often have a blockage there. Now, I'm assuming this blockage may be because the intake is in a back eddy and you get a buildup of sand and it gets into the system. Is there a way of mitigating that um, sand intake at, at the source so that we don't have these blockages reoccurring? We, uh, we've, we did a project in 2019, I believe, that installed a basically a sand separator. Um, it's a, a 100 micron um, self cleaning filter that has significantly reduced the the sand itself. What we're seeing now with the with the primary issue now with Wallachine is that we are treating water on demand. So we're trying to treat a flow rate of you know 100 liters per minute to 13,000 liters per minute with one system, which is practically not um impossible very you know, maybe not impossible because we're managing to do it somehow i don't know how but we yeah there's some magic involved maybe but um that's where the the reservoir options assessment really looked at that and the the result of the options assessment from the wallachine reservoir study was to put a res a treated water reservoir uh, storage tank in downstream of the filtration plant so that we would treat or filter the water on a um, consistent flow to fill up the reservoir. And then we would take that stored water, the treated water and pump it on demand to the, to the users. So that would um, eliminate that huge variation in flows that can go from when everyone, you know, 
does their dishes or turns on their their watering system um, that goes through the roof to where, you know, at midnight to 3 a.m. in Wallace Shade, most people are asleep. And we can tell that because we have no flow going through the system, right? So that will will help with that. There's not a, a lot more um, that we can do there, I don't think, right now. So. Okay, thank you. Director Hutton? Yes, I don't know, I might have missed it, but the two Pritchard systems, the water system and the sewage treatment system, I know we we give the green light here earlier this year, and then you probably have to do a design study and go to tender and and have a build. What is kind of the, the ETA or those going through the system and having a final building date? What are we approximately looking at? I'm looking around to see who can answer that because I don't know if you can, but oh okay. Um, our end stage, I think, aren't we? We our our goal is early late, I guess, you know, January to March, somewhere in there is go for procurement. And we're looking at an alternative procurement uh process for it. And then and there may be similar to what we did for the water plant with the wastewater plant, we may look at procuring the equipment first. So for instance, with the water treatment facility, we procured the membranes, the technology, and then the design could be completed around that technology because every manufacturer has uh, different requirements for inlet piping and like the civil portion of the of the project. So we're looking at at um between now, I believe uh, Ian Dougleish and I are, are working on those projects together. And we're looking at between now and, and November for a significant amount of meetings with our consultants to get this thing um, pushed forward and going. So, you know, 2025 is the earliest um, to see the either of the systems um, going through the, the commissioning process. So. And I'll just add to that, uh, Tyrone mentioned the alternate pro, uh, procurement process. So what we're looking at doing is uh, instead of a traditional tender where we design every spec of it through our engineers and get pricing for it, we're going to, um, we're, we're likely going to do a request for proposal process here um, where we're um, doing partial design, but really leaving it up to the industry to provide us with their ideas and technology that, and uh, and propose what would be you know, the most effective in terms of technology working there and cost effective to meet within our budget. Um, because as we experienced in the last scenario, our engineer design and the costing estimate from the previous engineer caused us the issue. So we're looking at doing an alternative system uh, procurement here. And it, this isn't uncommon. Um, uh, using City of Canvas as an example, they've moved to to this type of procurement for most of their um, uh, capital upgrades in recent years. I have a question about uh, Savinaw while we're waiting to find a grant to fit the pre-design. Um, would there be any value or any benefit in extending the line, uh, the water intake line uh, with the idea that we might get reduced turbidity if we got deeper into Kamloops Lake? Is that something that might be an interim while we wait to find some money? It, it may be, and I think that um, that would be an output from that CEPF grant, the Drought Resiliency um, Climate Change Grant that we'd be looking at, that we're applying for. So I guess the other comment on that is that there's still a significant amount of money involved to push a, an intake further out, um, as well as the pumps required and maybe having to, to revamp our pumping system there. Uh, we currently have a, a redundant pump in Savinoff for the intake. We only have one intake line out there, but we have a spare pump sitting on the shelf ready to go. Um, it would kind of be, um, it wouldn't. I don't think it'd be in our best interest at this point to have to throw those two pumps away that are perfectly fine right now and spend a bunch more money on that. But that is something that would be considered with the, when we're looking at drought um, or risk, the risk assessment that way, as far as securing the, the water source itself. So uh, certainly not an engineer, but I remember the engineers when they were designing the Tobiano system, which had water intakes that uh, the, they continued to say, the further we can go out at the Kamloops Lake, uh, the better turbidity conditions we will um, encounter. And uh, well, water advisories are a function of turbidity. <laughs> so uh, 
if uh, if we were to do some kind of study on whether that would actually do anything down in Savin, I know the you know the lake depths are different in Savin than they are in Tobiano. But uh, do we, we? I guess we have turbidity logs and information that we can go with uh, if we could measure what the turbidity might be another 50, 100 feet out, that might be useful information. Yeah, so I was involved with a couple of those. Um, what they're called, they're, is filtration deferral is what, what they're going after for this. And so that would allow us to, um, you access water that doesn't fluctuate based on, um, on currents and uh, weather conditions. You don't get the seiches that, that uh, reach that to that depth, that kind of thing. So Shushwap Lake and Okanagan Lake both have um, somewhere between the 23 and 27 meter range is where they need to be with their intakes to achieve the filtration deferral. There's more work to be done as well as that. Um, and I don't know if the work has been done on Kamloops Lake from other groups um, for that information. Those studies do take, the last one I did was about a year and a half. Um, at the end of two years, you, you got the results back. You still have to take that to um, Interior Health and get them to uh, defer filtration. And one of the things that we've looked at, and I looked at this when I first started here at the TNRD, um, there was the intent of looking at filtration deferral for all the systems and installing UV. So with chlorination and UV, you would meet with filtration deferral, meet the requirements. However, filtration deferral isn't a permanent um, solution because as we can see, conditions do change uh, with the source. And so as soon as your turbidity exceeds X amount, um, whatever those guidelines are as a result of that study, then you now have to go back to filtration anyways. So um, it is something might be worth looking at for Savannah. Uh, we are required by Interior Health to complete a source water assessment in Savannah. So that might be something we can we can tie in with that and perhaps expand that source water assessment to include potential for filtration deferral um, there. And that's something that we can take back to our, our consultants too, so. And just a follow-up comment on that with Kamloops Lake, um, you know, it is a, a unique lake where it's very different than Okanagan and Shushwap where the, the turnover of that lake is extremely rapid. Um, so it's, it's kind of a unique lake where it's kind of a river. Um, so the, the turbidity is, uh, because of the turnover, the turbidity is high throughout the lake, um, but, I, you know, I agree. It's it's something that we, if, if the opportunity is there to look into it, that we can consider. Any other questions? Uh, we'll move to new business. Uh, well, thank you, folks, for that uh, presentation. Uh, under new business, uh, I thought it would be useful to talk about um, the presentations that we made uh, at UBCM and follow up with that. I think everybody was at that presentation, at this committee was at that presentation. So I won't repeat the presentation other than to say that we asked the uh, ministry to consider uh, a matching funding source to our revenue stream. So I think it's really important that our December meeting, our numbers be tight and that we can demonstrate that, uh, that we're already asking our residents to uh, to pay their fair share or even more than their fair share. They're paying about a third of the uh, of our anticipated costs. We did ask that another that a fund be established, a small water systems fund. And I think that we should follow up um, with a letter uh, from our uh, TNRD to the minister that uh, that speaks to a matching fund. Uh, uh, a small water fund. And uh, the other concept was to cover the other one third was the uh, idea of participating in the property purchase transfer tax um, as people sell their their homes. Uh, there's a, there's a, a portion of funds that uh, get um, collected by the province. And uh, we asked that we be included in the distribution of some of those funds towards the for those people that are on the small water system. Um, and I think somebody said that we heard the, the, the phrase pilot project, so it might be useful to repeat pilot project in the letter 
uh, to remind them that that's what they were thinking about. But does anybody have any other comments about UBCM? Thank you, uh, CAO Hildebrand. Uh, thank you, Chair. And just for some clarity around your comments, typically after the UBCM, we get an official response from that meeting. So once we receive that, it would be nice to know what they're saying prior to us sending an additional letter. Um, because they would each one of those minister meetings would require a response from their staff. And so, yes, a, a pilot was um, was mentioned. I know I talked to Brian Bedford after the fact as well, and he did say they are working on something, but we should be receiving those follow-up letters from UBCM, I would think, in the next few weeks. Well, that's exciting. Uh, hopefully it's good news. Uh, does anybody have any other thoughts about UBCM uh, with regard to our utilities? None? Okay. Um, so I guess uh, we'll get the response and we're going to be meeting in December, so we might have an opportunity to talk about a follow-up letter at that time. Uh, that's great. Uh, we do have a little bit of time, and um, uh, I'd like to also talk about at UBCM, there was a trade show uh, uh, that I think we all frequented and saw interesting things. One of the things that uh, that I saw, I happened to encounter, uh, uh, I don't know, an engineering group or manufacturing group that manufactured the Tobiano water treatment plant. And uh, we've been uh, at, at this uh, committee, been talking about the many millions of dollars that we need uh, to uh, acquire through grants in order to build some of these systems. So um, I was a little taken aback when I uh, when I found this group and I asked them what the what the cost of a of a plant might be that would be similar to Tobiana. Now we're just talking about the uh, prefabricated treatment system that is at the Tobiano uh, facility. It's dropped into a building and then shackled onto pipes and all kinds of stuff. And the fellow said, oh, about $700,000. And I did what you did, uh, Yusuf. I sort of cocked my head and I said, maybe I didn't hear that right. How, can you repeat that? And it was $700,000. Um, I was encouraged by that. And of course, I've shared that with uh, with uh, Jamie, um, uh, because I know we're looking for solutions for water treatment. Uh, I don't know if this is just uh, hope, wishful thinking, but there might be um, uh, there might be package plant solutions for some or some of our systems out there. So, uh, Jamie, I wonder if you could comment on our conversations that we've had since then. Yeah, and I actually I'll probably turn it over to Tyrone as well. But I guess a, a general comment and following up from a discussion we had offline is, um, and I mentioned the, the alternate procurement process going to request for proposal. These are kind of the opportunities that we're hoping to, I guess, tease out or give options for these new technologies to come to the forefront instead of getting pigeonholed into exactly designs that our engineers tell us that we should build that a request for proposal gives the opportunity for the technology to come forward saying, here's what we can build. We can review that, see if it actually meets what we need to do, look at the pricing and, and, and go through those options. Tyrone, do you want to comment on the technology a little bit further? Yes, yeah, so I am. I'm quite familiar with the, the group that you um, mentioned or that you met. They, I used to work for Part of that company or they used to be part of the company i worked for and i also managed to run the tobiano utility for a while as well when i was previously at Corex. so um but just to it's the i like how you you phrase the um shackle it to all the other stuff it's all the other stuff that's really expensive um for instance in the pritchard uh wastewater or pritchard water treatment our membrane procurement there is about seven hundred thousand dollars for the technology so that's the package, the skid that you slide in and then shackle to all the other equipment. It's similar pricing there. Um, and I mean, whether their 700,000 is accurate or not, whether it's double that, it's still significantly less than the $10 million that our preliminary design came up with. It's the disposal of the residuals. It's the pipe in the ground. It's the, I mean, the engineering and the construction um, supervision of the, of the, construction and then the implementation of the facility plus the commissioning <clears throat> and then going back that adds the costs uh adds significantly to it uh going back to what jamie said there are alternate um processes and procurement processes and one of them you know design build where you say 
we as a TNRD would say, these are the requirements that we have. And we go to the market and say, show us that you can meet them and how you're going to meet them for this price. Um, there are alternate procurement policy or procedures or processes that we can use. And we are looking at considering using for the Pritchard um, systems specifically right now to try and, and um, reduce those costs because you do hear that, okay, the pa a package plant, 700, a million bucks. Meanwhile, you have Tyrone here telling you it's a $10 million project, right? It can be, oh, okay. If you do look at the preliminary design for Savinal, you'll see in there that there's a component for the treatment process and it is not $10 million for the treatment. It's, you know, I, I'm not sure what the number is. I haven't looked at it for a while, but it is a, it's just a small portion of it. So there are the buildings you have to build and then the pipe in the ground and everything else that so adds up a lot. So I, I, uh, I certainly appreciate that 700 grand isn't going to be the, the, the end number, but I was, I was happy to hear that there is a part of our solution that might be in that, uh, that price range. And just for director's knowledge, uh, the uh, this particular manufacturer uh, told me a story about a, um, a a used equipment dealer that had one of their unused plants. I guess somebody had ordered one, was intending to install it up in, uh, in northern BC, and that project fell sideways. This used uh, equipment dealer had this brand new plant built by these people. And they put a $5 million price tag on it. And uh, so when you're looking at one of these things, uh, you've got the guys that are manufacturing it saying, oh, we can build one of those for 700 grand. And yet you've got somebody else that's asking for $5 million for that sort of thing. So I, I think that when we're hearing these stories, we're, we're, we're very much looking for, uh, we're grasping for solutions and, uh, uh, we sure don't want to follow in the five million dollar plant uh, if we can get one for seven hundred grand. So, uh, continue to obviously pursue the, the 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 technologies that might get us where we need to be. I appreciate that. If there's no other uh, comments about that, I would just like to raise one issue, and it may not be appropriate for this committee other than um, I think that we've heard a lot in our electoral areas about the lack of, of internet uh, and cell phone capability. And uh, thinking about our meeting today, I was wondering if we would maybe go to our electoral area uh, committee and ask them if they could identify the areas in each of their electoral areas that, um, that have particularly poor cell phone or internet capabilities. We've recently seen a tower go in at Meadow Creek uh, near Logan Lake that uh, provided some kind of coverage. And I'm thinking that our utility uh, function uh, and our TNRD area, we might be able to somehow participate in the, uh, in the construction of a tower that we would then be, perhaps be able to hand over to a utility company. I understand that this is something that other rural areas are looking at um, uh, where they're trying to expedite uh, uh, cell phone and internet technologies in areas where the, the Telesas of the world or the, the Rogers just simply aren't interested. And if we can maybe uh, kickstart um, uh, the construction of a tower or something like that, that we can then turn around and sell or find some kind of project to that. Uh, Mr. Pierre, could you give some comment or direction or help on that? Yeah, a few comments. And this discussion has been at our board table for well, 10 plus years. Um, uh, but some recent, somewhat recent developments is the board authorized and funded a um, uh, what was it called? It was a, not a feasibility, a re review of the current infrastructure in the TNRD that was shared with the board. Uh, I believe that was completed about two years ago now that um, kind of identified um, gaps and, and opportunities around connectivity. Um, so what that did is sort of just provided some baseline data. Um, since then, uh, this board, well, it was the previous board now, um, we were approached by a, uh, a company, a nonprofit, but they work with uh, local governments across Canada and um, 
essentially what they propose or the idea that was presented to this board was a um, essentially what you're proposing that the uh, local governments could invest directly and even go after federal grant funding to invest directly in infrastructure instead of waiting for the telecoms to do that. Um, so there's definitely a model out there that some local governments have done. There isn't a lot of examples in BC, only a handful, um, and those have been municipalities. Uh, however, that, that concept is there. You know, I will say that it's... Um, so I guess I'm saying, yes, it's something that local governments can do. It would be a, a significant shift in what we're currently doing or currently, and even this came up through strategic planning, focus on the advocacy side, trying to push and advocate for the telecoms to increase their infrastructure. Um, so what you're discussing is an, an, is an option, but it would be a, a shift in, in what we're doing in terms of actually, okay, this is something the TNRD is gonna own and operate or, or at least build and own and operate and fund. Um, so that would open a whole sort of separate uh, function that we don't currently have any staff capacity for. Um, so definitely it warrants uh, further discussion. Um, as a follow-up to this, I'm happy to sort of recirculate that um, that report that was that was done a couple of years ago, uh, just so it's kind of at your at your fingertips to the to the EA directors uh, because that was the committee that that had this discussion. I'm just Scott, wondering, I, I, just I don't one... know if there's follow up. Sorry, anything further to that uh, Scott that you wanted to comment on in, in your uh, involvement? No, I think you covered. I think you covered most of it. I think our best avenue is to t continue to reach out to the Rogers and the and the Telluses of the world. And I've had conversations with them this week on. Um, I've had directors, EA directors come to me and ask me specifically, and I'm having meetings about those. Um, but I'm not sure it belongs necessarily in the utility committee. Um, it, it it probably needs to go to the board or it needs to at least start at the EA director table. Um, or we can actually work behind the scenes talking directly to Rogers and and to TELUS and to other kind of uh, telecom suppliers like that. What might be the best way to do it? Well, thank you for that. And I would certainly, as one EA director, like to participate or piggyback on some of those conversations if they're yeah. open because uh, we've got uh, we got a big gap there in our area J. Um, do any of the other uh, committee members here have any thoughts about uh, the best way to approach this? Is this better by individual EA people or should we be asking the EA committee itself or anybody have any thoughts on that? Director Houghton. I know in, in our area L, we've had various concerns. I know we've had letters come to the to the board here regarding the Highway 5A corridor from basically right from Kamloops through to Stump Lake and then the Director Laird's area right through to Merritt. And I know I've approached Scott on it and I believe he's brought it up recently with Rogers. And I don't know if we do these on a one-by-one -one case or what is the best way to handle it. I know you've looked after my interests a bit there. Uh, through you, Chair, um, to Director Houghton, that it specifically is the one I'm talking to um, tell us about tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow morning, she was supposed to meet with me this morning on a phone call and wasn't able to be on there, so I'm meeting with uh, with her tomorrow. Um, so if there's other ones that are priorities, you know, certainly let me know, but um, this would need, need to go to the EA director table and or the board itself. Director Smith? Yeah, I met with uh, TELUS at the UBCM uh, the representative that I've been that I've been dealing with for the last well for the last year on several of the areas and and um, I mean the bottom line is is the profitability of it and and as soon as you get into any kind of remote area uh, you know they they talk the talk but they really I mean she finally had to admit to me that I asked her about the Loon Lake area and the South Green Lake area which is all which was all included in that map that they put out six months ago based on whatever funding that they were going to get from the federal government uh but the bottom line is is that it's it's too expensive and 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 they're not you know per household by the time they by the time they put the services in uh it's just not profitable for them so they're i've been dealing with an independent contractor that's that's up in that area at a hundred mile house um and he's he's more nimble for sure than Telus is, and he can do the work. But he said the same thing. He's got to invest 
he's got to put a couple million bucks up front and uh, and at the end of the day he's got to get a return and and it's almost economically there's got to be another way of doing it like fiber optic which is the, which is the way that everybody talks about connectivity is is the way to go for sure and it's the most economical and all the rest of it but as soon as you get a little bit off the beaten track it is not economical anymore so it's uh some of those areas uh you know i mean she's been she's been very optimistic up until now but at the ubcm she said you know what there's some areas that we are just not going to get to period no matter how much money they give us so that's the concern that I have is, you know, especially with, with whatever conversations you're having with both Rogers and, and I'm not sure I'm just talking to tell us because they're the ones that, that responded to me the fastest and, and with the most information. But of course they put out a little general area map of where the, you know, the possible connectivity could come and right away people grab a hold of that and go, well, I'm, I, hey, I'm right in the, I'm right on the edge of that. So I should be, you know, I'm should be, I should be eligible to, you know, for, I mean, Loon Lake, for instance, they don't even have cell service out there and they don't, the landline services is, is terrible. So, I mean, you know what, that that's, they've been dealing with that for years and years and years. So I don't, I don't know what, what the answer to that is. Well, perhaps if you could circulate that old report for starters and we can think about all that good stuff. <laughs> Is there any other uh, utilities committee business that we want to raise or should we uh, adjourn this meeting? I guess we'll adjourn this meet. <laughs> oh, go ahead. A motion to adjourn. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Dr. Hayward. Okay, thank you everybody for this presentation. Bye-bye. Right.